What do you got there? Well, prepare to be amazed. The rarest Hot Wheel in the world. Is that what I think it is? The pink 1969 rear load beach bomb. That's the holy grail of Hot Wheels, isn't it? It sure is. It's uh, in mint condition. These are the original surfboards that go with it. Yeah, that was um, a ragtop Volkswagen, um, Volkswagen Transporter. We call it a bus, but technically it's a transporter. <laughs> I know a lot more about Volkswagens than I do Hot Wheels. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to sell my 1969 pink rear loader beach bomb, the rarest Hot Wheel in the world. And I've had it for about 15 years. My daughter's wedding is a little over a year from now, and maybe now's a great time to sell a Hot Wheel and raise some money for the wedding. Uh, it's pretty amazing. It's one of those little tidbits of history and collecting that, you know, generally you see in some guy's personal little museum or something like that. I mean, Hot Wheels came out in 68, and they got Mustangs, and they got Camaros, and they were so much faster than the Matchboxes. And me and every single kid in my neighborhood, we all had our Hot Wheels. All right, do you know anything about it? They actually stopped making this variety and made a different variety of the Volkswagen bus. Okay. Hence, this was never for sale to the public. That's why it's so valuable. OK. Hot Wheels was one of the greatest toys to come out in the late 60s, and they're still popular today. The fact that only a few of these were produced but never sent out to the public makes it incredibly rare. And being a Volkswagen bus, it's got a dual collector base. I have no idea what this is worth, but I know it's not going to be cheap. OK, so I'm assuming if you have the holy grail of Hot Wheels, you have a lot more Hot Wheels? I have about 6,000 Hot Wheels. I'm Hot Wheel crazy. OK. So what do you want for it? $150,000. Um, a bargain for the rarest of all rare toys. 150 grand. Um, damn. I don't even touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me call a friend. He owns a toy shack right down the street. He's a pretty big dealer in toys. He sure is. I know him. OK, so I'm going to give him a call. You hang out. Just guard that thing. OK. I'm confident that Johnny will verify this is a legitimate car, and it's the only one like it in the world. As for the value, I'm very interested myself to see what Johnny has to say. Hey, what's up, Rick? Oh, pretty good. Well, this, you supposedly know this guy? Hey, what's up, good Bruce? To see you. How, How are you? you? He has Quite this. Well. Like, supposedly, it's, oh, it is, it is. <laughs> wow. This is supposedly the greatest, most expensive Hot Wheels ever. <laughs> All the rumors are, are true about the rear loader beach bomb. When Rick called me and told me I had the Hot Wheels peak rear loader beach bomb, I couldn't believe it, and I couldn't get here fast enough. This is the rarest and most sought after Hot Wheel in existence. All right, so this is legit. This has changed the industry of collecting Hot Wheels. Nobody thought that anybody could make an impact on Matchbox. Matchbox dominated the diecast market. And then when Hot Wheels came out in 68, it was over. They were fast. You know, they had these Spectre Flame paint jobs. You know, it was never the same. And usually in the Hot Wheel collecting world, pink always means dollar signs. OK. And there's only, I believe, two pinks known. And one is a prototype, and the other one was an early production. OK. Do you mind if I take a closer Go look? Go ahead, look at and it. And we'll see what we have. Always have a white glove just in case, and this is one of those moments where the white glove comes out. So what are you looking for? This is a different base than the early production ones. So this is definitely the prototype. And there's certain things in the lettering, the bumpers, even like uh, flaws in the casting that are only available to the prototypes in the early production. Some of these two are, are just raw. It's just not cleaned up like it is in the, in the later ones, and also the knockoffs. Everything looks 100% correct. Okay. So what do you think it's worth? These were like 60 cents back in the 60s, and now they're still under a dollar. But there's some heavy hitters in the Hot Wheel world that would jump on a prototype like this. This would be easily $100,000 for this car. OK. All right, well, thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Care. In the Hot Wheels market, there's nothing close to this. I mean, this is the holy grail of Hot Wheels. This is what everybody goes after. This is the rarest, and this is in the best condition. And that's why it goes for $100,000. So I'm thinking 60? Nah, we're not in the same neighborhood. I'll go 65 grand. 
No, I'll go down to 140. I mean, I go as high as 70. Nah. It's just, it's just not going to do it. I guess when you're talking about world record cars and the holy grails, kind of what I want to sell it for one day and somebody else wants to pay, and uh, I guess today's not the day. Well, thanks for coming in, man. Thank it, you very much. It was cool to see it. OK. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Unfortunately, this is truly my pink baby. I appreciate his offer of $70,000, uh, but in this case, I think this car is worth probably at least twice that much. Hey, how's it going? Good, how's it going? I have this amazing comic book I would like for you guys to check out. Yeah, let me see it. Yeah, don't you touch that. <laughs> Why? You know what this is? Spider-Man? Uh, this isn't just, like, number one Spider-Man. This is the first time anybody saw Spider-Man. Oh. You have one of the, like, holy grails of comic books. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where did you get this? Uh, my brother and I, about 20 years ago, we bought a collection of comic books, and this was just, just in there. That's amazing. Oh, you're like the guy who buys the uh, Andy Warhol at a, a garage sale. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to sell one of the most amazing comic books that's ever been. I'm going to ask $16,000. I think if they'll see the potential of this, I mean, everybody knows Spider-Man with all the movies. I think this is a great opportunity for them to get this item. Well, that's real, man. I'll be blown away because The Amazing Spider-Man was the number one in this series. This is like the introduction to that. It was kind of like the comic books version of a TV pilot. Yeah. You know, they, they did it, they tested it out, they gave the whole backstory, and I think we all know how well Spider-Man has caught on. Well, this was a whole new era for comic books. It's hard to exaggerate how important this thing is. I mean, this is where the entire mega franchise of Spider-Man began. And to collectors, it's practically priceless. I could probably charge people just to look at it. So do you have any particular amount you're looking for on it? Yeah, I'd like to sell for 16000 For a comic book? Or this comic book? Um, you know, it might be worth it. Comic books had their heyday where they were going for obscene amounts of money, and then they dropped. Do you mind if I have a buddy of mine come down and take a look at it? He can give me an idea of what it's worth. That'd be great. I mean, to be quite honest with you, I don't even want to be responsible for taking this thing out of the cover. Let me give him a call, and I'll be right back. Uh, that'd be great. This is one of the most valuable comic books ever, but price tag depends on condition. So I'm going to need to bring in the big guns to help me out on this one. Amazing Fantasy 15, man, fantastic. I've seen one in a 9.6 condition go for over a million dollars. That's exactly why I didn't want you to touch it. <laughs> So what are your concerns about the book, Corey? You know, I can tell the difference between a 1 and a 10, but I can't tell the difference between a 4 and a 7. <laughs> yeah. It's apparent we see some chipping here, which is very common with the paper they used back then. It's really tough to duplicate that. Let me just make sure we have all the pages here. This is such a classic page here. High school setting, Peter Parker. He's Midtown High's professional wallflower. So they're kind of poking fun of him. Everything looks intact. Doesn't seem like we're missing any pages. That's great, man. What do you think? On a scale of 1 to 10, now I'd put this in the 5 range. Very good to find condition. Closer to the six to $7,000 range. Really? That's way, way less than where I would put it. Um, just you got a lot of issues on the cover, and the cover is everything. The million dollar book, it would have had none of this shipping, no stamp. It had no staining, no binding issues, no creases. Right on, Johnny. I appreciate it. All right, cool. I was really shocked when he said $7,000. The condition of fine would be worth a whole lot more than $7,000. What's your bottom number on the comic? I, I mean, uh, I was saying 16, and I would go 13. 13? I mean, the most I'm going to pay is 7. I mean, so we've got a huge gap there. I can tell you from my experience, this is the worst time in history to be selling comic books. Mm. I could go 11. You know, with the condition issues that it has, it's just not there for me. All right, bottom line, 10,000.
You know, man, I hate to lose the comic over 3,000 bucks, but I've got to stick at seven. Sorry, man. All right. Appreciate it. I would love to have the superpower of kind of helping someone see things clearly. I think they would have realized this is worth a whole lot more than $7,000. What do we got here? Uh, I got some records I want to sell. Well, some records. And what is this now? Hotel California, one of the most popular songs of all time. That's exactly what it is. No, Chum, I'm asking you, what's the deal with the dog strapped to your chest? Oh, I didn't feel like holding her anymore. I'm here at the pawn shop today, and I'm trying to sell my really cool album collection. I have 12 records in my collection. I acquired these albums over years, but also my grandpa gave me some of those in his estate. I'm looking to get $500 for my vintage record collection. Beetlejuice, now this is cool. One of the biggest movies I remember as a kid. I mean, Michael Keaton was so cool in this movie, and the soundtrack was just awesome. I mean, Danny Elfman made this album. He produced it, and it complements the movie so well. You remember this song, Deo? I remember that song. You used uh, to sing that song all the time in junior high. No, I never sang that song all the time in junior high. All right, maybe I remember, I remember the movie. Suicidal tendencies. Now, there is a band from our childhood. They got a lot of play on MTV from Institutionalized. You remember, right? Mm -hmm. That is a good album. Johnny Burnett and the Rock and Roll Trio. I ain't never heard of it, but just because I ain't never seen it don't mean it's not good. I mean, this one actually looks like it's in pretty good condition. Look at that. Oh, that's a beauty. It's even got some kind of poster or something in there. Beatles, boy band. The Beatles, this isn't just any Beatles album. This is the first Beatles album released in America. Introducing the Beatles. I think this album came out in 1963. They come from England, then they just took over the freaking rock world in America. This is one of the hardest albums to get. I know for a fact this album is worth money. A few hundred dollars easy. Now, how much are you looking for? I want to get 500 bucks out of them. 500 is a little steep. It's chum before anything. Let's get somebody down here that actually knows what he's doing when it comes to stuff like this. You're looking at them. I mean, you might know the bands or the artists, but you don't know anything about records. You don't know what ones are collectible. You don't know if any of them are fake. You don't even know what sport you're playing, Chum. Pinky, tell him. He's going to eat his words on that. Could you do 250 for this collection? Nah, dude, you're breaking my heart. How about 480? Chum, I told you to get somebody down here to look at the records. I know I can make money if you're willing to sell them for $345. I know I can make money at that. This is all 100% you, buddy. And Pinky's getting really excited. I know she wants these albums. 345 it's final offer. I'll go for it. All right. I guess I'll go write them up, Big Hoss. You go ahead and study these records and enjoy them. Won't be the last time you're seeing them. Come with me. For the record, I only agreed to $345 because Pinky liked it. Dig in there. That's what you do with right, records so, you dig, right? So we got Duke Ellington and John Coltrane. If this was a first issue, you're looking at about $200, but it's a reissue. Uh, it's probably $20. OK. This guy, Suicidal Tendencies. Classic band, right? If you grew up in the 80s in Los Angeles, you knew this band. This is good. First edition? First. It is? This is a good one. Oh, yeah. This is good. $100 for that, for okay. sure. Easy sell. Okay. All day long. It, you'll, you'll have 20 people waiting to buy that guy. The Beatles, this has to be good, right? This is their first record. Unfortunately, this is a bootleg. It's not real. Still a great record, but probably $15 to $20 on that one. Beetlejuice. I love Beetlejuice. <laughs> you know, this is really hard to find. Danny Elfman, one of my favorites. This thing looks, oh my god, are you kidding me? Whoa. Somehow, the sun got a hold of this one, and it's uh, warped. I don't know what happened to that thing, but uh, someone left it in the car, probably. 50 turns into $5 on this guy. Holy moly. Banger city right here. This is Johnny Burnett. If this is real, this is a big deal record. OK, I don't without I didn't this know record, about that record. Without this record, there's no punk rock. Something special happened in Memphis in 1954, 1955. You had these guys doing hillbilly music, combining with R&B, creating something called rockabilly. Elvis did rockabilly, but these guys were doing like what I would call that punk rock vibe, you know, with one foot forward and just strumming, you know? Yeah. This is the holy grail of rock and roll. I'm filling a $1,000 record on my hand. Oh. Is that a good O or a bad O? It is. Oh, come on, Big Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> this is great. You have one in we your collection? We can put all this away. This is all you need, right here. All right. This is all you need. And the value is? About 1500 
because no one has this record. Okay. Everyone wants this record. All right, Corey can eat my shorts. Oh, all day long. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't think I made a good deal. Oh, but... no, no. This, the, you, you're, you're good. I'm good. This is it. This is it. I'm in the gold. Beetlejuice put me in the toilet. Yep. Johnny Burnett Johnny... put me in the gold. That's right, man. I'm on a golden <laughs> throne now. <laughs> That's a quick profit for me, especially would, would you, since the value's in about three of them. What'd you pay for it? 345. <laughs> Baby, that was awesome. Chum stock today, it started off a little slow, but it ended up with a lot of heat. That Johnny Burnett record off the chain, he's got $1,600 worth of records, so he's definitely in the money, and I can't wait to see Corey's face. That's a great deal. That might deserve one more horn. I mean, it's a pretty good deal, you know? Yeah, there we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll be doing this all week. These yours? Yes. What exactly are they? Oh, we got a couple of Murray Eliminator muscle bikes from 1969. And that one is actually NOS. It has never been written. So we're going to have to take these for a test spin before you sell them. Just hear him say that no one's ever ridden this one. That's why I want to make sure it works. I've been collecting bikes for about 20 years. I got into the Murrays probably about 10 years ago. I liked them because they were different from any other bike out there. I'm hoping to get $8,000 for the pair, and the least amount I would take was probably $7,500. So what can you tell me about the bikes, man? That one is a Murray F3 three-speed bike. The guy I got it from uh, found it in a bicycle shop that had been shut down since the 80s. It was in the box, and uh, I tried to keep everybody off. My kids have tried to ride it, and I told them, no, you're not riding this one. All right. And this one is a Murray Eliminator Mark II, five-speed. This is the first year they offered these. Uh, they're pretty unique because of the pretzel handlebars, kind of funky. This one has a brake shift. They call it a drag shifter. You would pull it down, and it would uh, lock the back wheel up, and you'd, you'd be able to make a cool burnout. And then this is a billboard chain guard. This is all new for Murray. They made the chain guard big and loud to uh, make the kids go ooh and ah. <laughs> <laughs> Any particular reason you got Murray's instead of Schwinn's, or? Yes. I've been collecting bikes for about 20 years, and I started collecting Schwinn's like most guys do. And... I just said, you know what? I want to collect something that nobody has. I seen these on, uh, on a picture, and I thought, I got to have one of these. All right. Um, yeah, in late 1950s, early 1960s, a lot of people started customizing cars. There was a lot of motorcycle movies out there. Naturally, kids started doing it with their bicycles. Schwinn was like one of the first people to catch on and start doing the big sissy bars. And they called them wheelie bikes. Schwinn was extremely successful with the Stingray. And so Murray said, hey, sounds like a good idea to us. <laughs> yep. uh, so they started making them, too. Murray has been producing bikes since the 1930s. And while at first they were pretty expensive, they eventually became known by their competitors as the ones to follow when it came to pricing. Kind of like us here at Gold and Silver. <laughs> what do you want to do with them, man? Uh, I'd like to sell them. Any idea of how much you're looking to get, or? Uh... This one I'm asking 6000 for, and that one I'm asking 2000 for. It's a lot of money for Murray's, man. They're all original everything? Yes, uh, they're all original, down to the nuts and bolts. All right. You mind if I have a buddy come down and check them out? Oh, no, go ahead. Let me bring in somebody that I know that can kind of tell me a little bit about these. Let me know if they're all original and everything good. like that. All right, I'll be right back. All right. Uh, I, I pretty much know what it is, and I'm open to somebody coming in and basically confirming my uh, knowledge and what, what I have. Got some Murray Eliminator bikes. Nice. Back in the 50s, across the country, people were customizing motorcycles. Same thing was going on with the bikes back then. Guys were customizing their bikes and making them look like the choppers they were seeing out there. So in 62, Huffy came out with the first of the muscle bikes. They came out with this type of styling. And then you had the Stingray that came out a year after that. And Murray was trying to get on the bandwagon, too. They started coming out with this F-Series. And they made that bike from 67 for about 10 years. And this style of bike, I believe, only came out one year, which was 69. And this had all the bells and whistles. I mean, 
This is definitely the holy grail when it comes to Murray bikes here. All right. So what are your concerns, Corey? Um, you want to give my look over, see if they're all original? OK, yeah, I'll check them out. Um, there's a few things we look for. We want to see the tampos are original here. You know, we got a few nicks, and um, the cover tampos seems to be coming off a little bit. But all looks original, all feels right. All the chrome seems right, doesn't seem like it's been refinished. What we're looking for is factory correctness, and everything's factory correct. All the parts are original. This is exactly the way the bike would have looked like. Let me look over this one. What I love is just the feel of the seat. I mean, it seems like you've stored them in a nice, cool place, because they're not hard or cracking. That's what you want to see. Everything checks out. Everything's 100% original on both of them. All right. Um... <clears throat> It's a big question, man. What do you think they're worth? Well, that bike there, about 1200 OK. You don't think the fact that uh, being NOS would make it worth a lot more? 1200 would be the premium on that bike. This bike here, definitely the holy grail. You don't see too many of these come to market. 3000 to the right buyer. Nah. Yep, Johnny, I appreciate you, man. All right. Take care, guys. The sellers seem to disagree with my appraisal, but just like the stock market, these items go up and down all the time. The Mark II is one of the more sought after Murray bikes, but in today's market, I believe it would bring $3,000 tops. So I'll go three for the pair, or if you just want to sell me this one, I'll do 700. I can't do that. Huh? I've got more than that in that one. I got to have at least 15. And I can't go down any lower than 5,500 on this one. Man, we are really, really far off, buddy. Um, looks like we're not going to make a deal. All right. Take care, buddy. Thank you. Guess I won't be riding the bike today. They definitely made a mistake today. They'll never find another one like that in the same condition. Uh, you know, their loss.